Next, we move away from linear algebra constructions, focus on techniques specific to representation theory. Our first major result is Schur's lemma. Here, we'll have two irreducible representations, pi v and pi prime v prime. We'll have an intertwining operator L carrying v to v prime. So L is linear, carries the g action for v to the g action for v prime. Then, either L is zero or L is an equivalence. So when we have irreducible representations, there's no middle ground. It's either nothing or everything. For the proof, we'll assume that L is non-zero. I first want to show that the kernel of L is a sub-representation of V. So that just means if I take any vector in the kernel of L, we apply any pi of G, we get another element that's in the kernel of L. Now, if V is in the kernel of L, that just says that L of V is zero. So I want to show that L of pi G of V is also zero. If I take L of pi G of V, the intertwining operator property allows us to move the g to the outside as pi prime of g, and then we have L of v. Since L of v is zero, this is equal to zero, and that shows that pi g of v is also in the kernel of L. So sub-representation. Now, because v is irreducible, that only leaves two options. Either the kernel of L is zero, or all of v. Because we have the L is non-zero, the kernel of L must be exactly zero, and L is one-to-one. -one. Now, we do the same argument for the image of L. Okay, I'll show that's a sub-representation of V prime. Again, there are only two options by irreducibility. So the image of L is zero or V prime itself. Since we have the L is non-zero, it must be everything. So that says that L is onto V prime. Because L is one to one onto, it's an isomorphism of vector spaces. We're assuming it's an intertwining operator, so that means L must be an equivalence. And that's our result. Now, first corollary. Okay, we assume that V is equal to V prime. Okay, still irreducible. If I have L going from V to V an intertwining operator, then L must be a multiple of the identity operator. So we're just gonna have lambda i for some lambda in C. For the proof, first we note that the complex numbers are algebraically closed, so L has at least one eigenvalue in the complex numbers. We form L minus lambda i from V into V, straightforward to show that this is an intertwining operator. So by Schur's lemma, we have that the kernel is non-zero, so it must be all of V, and we have that L minus lambda i is precisely zero. That means L is equal to a multiple of the identity, and that's our result. In turn, we use this to show corollary two. So if we have pi, pi prime, irreducible representations, L1 and L2 carrying V to V prime are equivalences, though we must have that L2 is a multiple of L1. Now, to show this, I'm gonna form L1 inverse composed of L2, which carries V back to itself. Now, L1 and L2 are equivalences, so that means they're vector space isomorphisms, so the composition is gonna be a vector space isomorphism also. We'll leave it as an exercise for later to show that this is also gonna give us an intertwining operator. Now, because of this, we have by corollary one, that L1 inverse composed of L2 is a multiple of the identity. So if I apply L1 to both sides, we have the L2 is lambda times L1, and that's our result. Exercise, suppose L is in HOM from V to V prime. Show that G acting trivially on L is equivalent to L being an intertwining operator. Okay, and recall from last time, we have this definition for the G action on linear transformations. Now, we can recast Shor's lemma to say something about unitary representations. If we have pi v irreducible, the previous exercise shows that the trivial representation occurs exactly once in HOM from V to V as the intertwining operators. Now, we can rewrite HOM V to V as other familiar vector spaces. 
Now, in the previous part, we saw that Hom from V to V is equivalent to the dual of V tensored with V itself. Then by taking double dual, that's gonna give us the original vector space back. I'll have that this is equivalent to the dual of V tensored with the dual of V. If we assume that pi is unitary, we've seen that the dual of V is equivalent to the complex conjugate of V. So we make this substitution here. And then we can interpret this space. So this is gonna be the set of all linear functionals from V tensored with the complex conjugate of V into the complex numbers. These are just gonna be space of sesquilinear forms. So sesquilinear form, okay, you can just think of your Hermitian inner product as being a model for that. For sesquilinear, okay, the conditions are gonna be much weaker. So we're gonna have the bilinearity condition, which just lets us break up the form if we have sums in either slot. The sesquilinear part, okay, sesquil means one and a half. So if I pull a scalar out of the first slot, it comes out as is. If we pull it out of the second slot, it comes out as a complex conjugate. If we want the stronger condition of Hermitian, we would add in that if I switch the order, okay, in our form, we'll wind up putting in a complex conjugate. But that's not required for sesquilinear. Now, example of a sesquilinear form, if I have a unitary representation, I could just take the invariant Hermitian inner product on V. Now, if we follow out all of these correspondences, I'm gonna have a map that carries each linear transformation, or elements from HOM V to V, to the space of sesquilinear forms. And I could do that by just taking a linear transformation L, then we put it in the first spot in our invariant Hermitian inner product. Now, exercise. First, figure out the G action on the space of sesquilinear forms. Then we want to show that this map here is an equivalence of representations. So I want to show that HOM V to V is equivalent to the space of sesquilinear forms. Here's some help with the last problem. We have the double dual of V, it's isomorphic to V as a vector space and as a G representation. So let's see how this works. Going from right to left, if we take any vector V and V, we're gonna send it to evaluation at V on the left-hand side. Now, what is the double dual? This is the set of linear functionals on linear functionals on V. So a map in here is gonna take a linear functional and return a complex number. So if I take a fixed vector V and put it into each linear functional, complex numbers are gonna come out. Now, there are a few things we have to verify here. First, that E sub V is a linear functional on V star. So if I took constant times F1 plus F2, that pulls apart linearly. Then I'll want this map going from right to left is a vector space isomorphism. Once we have that, we want to show the intertwining operator property. So let's do that here. Now, if I have G acting on one of these evaluation maps, okay, and then we evaluate that at a linear functional F, okay, our rule is we just push the G in with an inverse. Now, once we have this here, we can evaluate at V, and then I'll take the G inverse in here, push it onto the V as G itself. That gives us F evaluated pi of G of V, and that's gonna be an evaluation map at pi G of V. So what's happening here, this G is factoring through our map here. So that means we have an intertwining operator. Because we have a vector space isomorphism, we're gonna have an equivalence between these two representations. Now, if we go back to our string of correspondences from before, recall, C times the identity map was the unique trivial representation in HOM. So if we follow the correspondences out, that's gonna say that C times our invariant Hermitian or product is a unique trivial representation in the space of sesquilinear forms on V. So that means if we're looking for invariant sesquilinear forms, they all rise in this manner. With that, we have the following proposition. So, if we have pi v irreducible unitary, 
the invariant Hermitian inner product is unique up to multiplication by a real positive scalar. We also have, if I take I times our Hermitian inner product, that's gonna be the unique invariant non-degenerate skew Hermitian form up to multiplication by a non-zero scalar. So that's gonna follow immediately from this correspondence here. One last item. We showed the notions of equivalence and unitary equivalence are essentially the same for irreducibles. Now, if we have representation pi v, finite dimensional for finite group G, we've seen the following recipe for turning pi into a unitary representation. So we'll take any Hermitian inner product on v, we'll apply this averaging operator, and what comes out is a Hermitian inner product and invariant. So with respect to this Hermitian inner product, pi is now unitary. For the big picture, I'll assume that we have pi and pi prime irreducible and equivalent. Okay, the equivalence will be implemented by L carrying V to V prime. Using our recipe, we turn both representations into unitary representations. So we'll now have invariant Hermitian inner products, okay, angle bracket and angle bracket prime by Schur's lemma. Okay, factoring through our equivalence, these two invariant Hermitian inner products are equal up to a scalar. Okay, that scalar is real and positive. Now, that says up to a scalar, pi and pi prime are now unitarily equivalent. So, what does this say? For finite groups, if we're concerned with irreducibles, it's enough just to consider equivalence. So, if we think in terms of equivalence classes, okay, what we're having here is that the classes for equivalence will turn out to be the same for unitary equivalence.